The reading this morning is taken from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Hello and welcome. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Ollie Benyon, and over the last uh, number of weeks, we've been going through the book of 2 Timothy and looking at a series called Making Your Life Count. Now, before uh, we get into our text, I wanted to say, uh, with making your life count, it is not about us. Uh, it's not about uh, being successful or achieving greatness. Um, no matter how noble our achievements are, it's not about having something of significance that we can bring to the Lord at the end of our lives. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. So when we join God's family, you know, we, we die to ourselves. You know, what we do is all about Jesus and it's all about building his kingdom. And in our passage today, uh, Paul encourages the young Timothy that to, to keep going, to endure to the end. The late Cardinal Basil Hume was once a headmaster in Appleforth School in the 60s. And on one occasion, he was in front of a, a class of six formers who, who, who all looked pretty miserable. And uh, they were complaining that they were having to go to chapel twice a day and thinking you know, what as the gospel what is the point of all this it's going to be relevant to our lives and um, at one point the class spokesman he stood up and he said this sir henry will be a stockbroker graham will inherit an, an, a large estate uh, george is to be a land agent michael a doctor charles is so stupendously rich he, he's he's going to never need to work a day of his life so what is the relevance of all this God stuff to any of us? Hume looked thoughtfully and quietly replied. Gentlemen, the statistics indicate with dreadful certainty that as you go through life, you will encounter appalling problems. There is at least 30% chance that you will find your wife is unfaithful to you. A 40% chance you will be unfaithful to her and she will find out. There is a 30% chance you will face divorce. The 40% chance that your children will get hooked on drugs or be completely wildly out of control. There is 20% chance that you will find yourself estranged to your children. 25% of you will be fired from your job or be made redundant. There is 50% chance that one of your children will die before you do, as well as your wife there is a 40% chance you will face acute financial hardship and 30% chance of bankruptcy. Then a long silence. And at least a 20% of you will face criminal prosecution and 15% chance you will end up in prison. Here, Charles, I'm looking at you. And 100% of us will face grave illness and death. At this, at, um, at all these ghastly times, gentlemen, you will be glad I insisted that you know the gospel of Christ. Thank you. And he swept out, leaving a stunned class in his wake. As followers of Jesus, the purpose of our existence is not limited to our lives today, but it's for our future glory tomorrow. Paul has come to this point of his life when that future glory is soon to become a reality. 
And he is in prison in an underground, dingy kind of dungeon with a hole in the, in the ceiling to bring in air. He is in, he is in chains. He is lonely. He, for a long time, no one knew where he was, only to be found by a friend who had to do painstakingly searching him, at him out. He was waiting trial with little hope of escaping execution. And so with so much personal trial, you might expect Paul to think, well, just, just abandon your faith. Get angry with God for, for abandoning you. Because surely after all your sacrifice and all the hard work that God should be rewarding you some, some kind of treasure or pleasure in this life, this wouldn't have been the retirement plan that Paul had in mind. But no, that wasn't how he, how he spoke. You know, even in his darkest moments, he was able to look back at his life and say, you know, with confidence that he had made his life count. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he's now holding up his life to his friend, his young friend, Timothy as a model for him to live by. And he's telling him, don't give up. To follow my lead, because living for Jesus until the very end, even though it's costly, is the only way to make your life count. And then Paul gives uh, Timothy four instructions that will help him to endure, to keep going to the end. Verse five, he says this, Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So the first one is keep your head in all situations. Or another way of putting it is to be sober-minded. Uh, I recently came back from a holiday uh, with my family uh, and we went to, to York. And one of our day excursions, we decided to, to walk around the, the city walls. Now, you, you think not many things can go wrong there, but somehow we managed to get lost walking around the city walls. And I've said this before on one of these videos that I, I've, I've, I'm not great at asking for directions. And uh, though after, uh, you know, intense, sustained, uh, you know, pressure from my beloved wife, I, I conceded that maybe I should go and ask help. So I walked up to the first two gentlemen that I saw sitting on a park bench to ask them for directions. This is a big mistake. You know, they, were, they were drunk. They were really, really drunk. And I spent five, 10 minutes having to listen to their garbled instructions about you know, which way I should be going or how the route is changed and you could go this way, you might want to try that way, all that. And it went on and on and on and it made no sense and just made things worse. Now, you know, it's not surprising that we use the word sober to be, to be the opposite of, of drunk. You know, we are called to be sober-minded people, to be those who, who take our faith seriously, who have a clear head when it comes to giving directions uh, to Jesus, pointing people to the way, who have lives that are, are well balanced, not just publicly in front of people, but also behind the scenes. This is an instruction for us to be steady in our faith. So not being, you know, really up one minute and then crashing out the next. Paul is not saying that we will never waver or experience times of, of hardship that we will find really difficult. You know, we all do and we all will. But what Paul is saying is there are foundations, you know, a firm base that we can, we can play, put in place to help us to, to be steady in our walk with Jesus, that we won't keep getting knocked back. And what does that firm base look like? What well, do you spend... Uh, it'll be very simple, really, but it's do you spend, you know, do you have a daily relationship with Jesus? Do you, do you spend time with him in prayer? I don't mean just, you know, PS prayers, but proper time seeking him. Uh, as Ellie last week spoke to us, are you 
spending time, quality time reading his word and allowing you know, God's thoughts to, to penetrate your thoughts? Are you in fellowship with other Christians, other believers? I know that's really difficult at the moment, isn't it? But it's so important to try to find out ways that we can be in fellowship with one another, to share life with the body of Christ. Now that should be our base. You know, resting on the relationship we have with our Lord, who is with us to steady us, to comfort us, to help us through times of, of pressure and danger, to give to us the wisdom and power we need to live out our faith today. So keep your head in all situations. The next instruction Paul gives Timothy is to endure suffering. Now, as we you know, live in a fallen world, we all at different points in life endure suffering, some uh, more than others. However, the suffering Paul is talking about comes from godliness. Paul says early in his letters, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It just, it just happens. It's part of it. When you're going against the culture, that's what's going to happen. And that, it remains true today as well. Um, we know around the world, many Christians who profess to know Jesus have their lives uh, are at stake for saying that. I remember the story of Yusuf uh, Nadakani. Um, you know, he was born in Iran uh, into the uh, Muslim faith, but at the age of 19, he became a Christian and uh, he became a church pastor in Iran. And um, uh, later on, he, you know, he, he got married and he has two kids and he, he's now, uh, uh, I think about 42 years old. Um, though in 2010, he was arrested and he was sentenced to, to death for apostasy, for converting to Christianity from Islam. Now, thankfully, after sustained pressure, it was all over the news uh, that the decision was to reverse that. And in, in 2012, he was released. During his trial, though, Pastor Nadakani, he refused to recant his belief, uh, even though he faced the highest sentence, which was death. He told the judge, I'm, abs I'm, I'm resolute in my faith and Christianity and have no wish to recant. It is incredible that there are people in our world uh, who profess to know Jesus that are willing to, to put their lives in the line. And that's such, a, 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 such an incredible thing. You know, we, we may never have that test, that, 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 that test of our, of our lives, but Maybe there are other things. Maybe our reputations will be at risk. It means maybe we're not taken seriously. Maybe it's our, our views are seem outdated and not relevant anymore. Or, or um, maybe we're passed over unfairly in situations. But Paul is telling Timothy, no matter how hard it is, it is worth it. Don't give up. Tim Keller writes, who's a pastor in America, why is it so hard to do the right thing if you know it's gonna cost you money, reputation, maybe even your life? Why is it so hard to face your own death or the death of loved ones? It's so hard because we think this broken world is the only world we're ever going to have. But if Jesus is risen, then your future is so much more beautiful and so much more certain than that. I love that picture that Jesus, you know, our, our, our future is so much more beautiful and so much more certain than that. That may be our future, but right now when we're going through hardship, that it's still difficult, isn't it? It's still hard. How do we endure it through right now? Well, like Paul, you seek out support from, from other believers. You know, he's writing out, he's calling out for help uh, throughout his letter. Um, uh, he, you know, it's remembering God's promises in his word. Maybe it's practicing gratitude, thanking God for what he has done and what, uh, in, in your life. It's on prayer. It's, it's through worship. It's, it's on receiving the strength that we can call upon in, through, through the Holy Spirit. It is to be part of God's church. 
The next instruction uh, Paul gives Timothy is this. Do the work of an evangelist. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that Timothy was an evangelist and uh, in many ways it, it probably wasn't as it were told that he was quite timid, uh, quite fearful and often liked to uh, keep to himself. Paul instead tells him to do the work of an evangelist because ultimately all the gifts that we, God gives us are to, to be used in the world and, and for the church. Uh, and the church is in the world in order to teach it the truth about life and about God and to offer the world the good news about forgiveness and about healing of Jesus, in Jesus' name. Now that is the work of the church, to reach the world. It's about building his kingdom. Now you might not think of yourself as an evangelist, but let me tell you, you are an evangelist. Yeah, yes, there are some people who have the gift of evangelism and they, they're able to bring many, through God's help, bring many people to, to know Jesus. But we're all called to be witnesses of Jesus and use whatever gifts God has given us to be able to do that. And we are all kingdom workers. So, you know, if you have the gift of hospitality, then use that gift to lavish God's love onto people uh, uh, in, in the way that you know how to do that. If you have the gift of teaching, why not come alongside people and help them understand and open up the scriptures and point them to Jesus that way? If you have the gift of generosity, why don't you use that to bless others and to show God's kindness and his abundant generosity towards us? Whatever gifts God has given you, use them to point to Jesus, to be a witness. Lois and I have been thinking about what it, what it means, a what, what, lot, lot about the kingdom of God. You know, what does that look like today? And you know, we don't have the answers, but what I, what I know it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like lots of you know, flashy church events or, or kind of worldly success. That's not what it looks like. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be impressive. Building the kingdom of God is, is ultimately just by obeying Jesus, saying yes to Jesus' command. And that can happen, you know, in the simplest ways. That can start in your own kitchen. It can start sitting around your own dining room table and showing love to uh, someone else. So please don't be intimidated or put off thinking, Actually, I can't do this. You know, you know building the kingdom is, is, is as simple as just using your gifts. Being a witness is just using your gifts and, uh, and, and helping people see Jesus through that. And the final instruction Paul gives Timothy, he says this, fulfill your ministry. Now I'm going to let you into a, a little secret about my past. I haven't told many people this. Now I am. Um, now for most of my life, up to the age of maybe 18, I used to ride horses. And I don't mean, you know, taking an old horse and riding around the paddock a bit. You know, I was part of an elite club, pony club. And um, this, I've actually got a picture, put this picture up. Uh, this is me riding Taff Lad. Uh, and, you know, as you can see, determination, uh, quite a big fence. I'm sure you're rather impressed. Um, and the most significant thing about Pony Club was the fact that once a year that you'd get sent away for a whole week to camp in some field where you would train and uh, uh, learn how to, to, to master these, these beasts of animals, how you become the best at uh, riding them. And um, every year an award was given to the person who had excelled more than any other in achieving that goal. And they would be awarded the Pony Club Camp Cup. Now for years I'd watch people come and go and receive this coveted trophy and I made it my life's goal to uh, receive it myself. And so the year finally, the day finally arrived when I was uh, about to uh, you know, finish Pony Club, I was about to graduate, surely this was my year. I spent 14 years working towards this moment, plotting manes and polishing saddles and all those things, hoping they would finally announce that I would be the winner. The announcement came. 
The award for this year's Pony Club Camp Cup goes to Emma Dixie. Emma Dixie, Emma, I couldn't believe it. I'd been passed over, snubbed for Emma Dixie. Unbelievable, I was fuming. But it, it wasn't over. The awards hadn't finished. Uh, another award was gonna be presented for the first time and the crowd went silent. The announcement came and for one year only, this special trophy is to be presented to the person who has been faithfully coming every year for over a decade now. The long-term camper cup goes to Ollie Benyon. What? I was fuming. The long-term camper cup. That's basically the cup for turning up. That's the loser cup. Who wants the long-term camper cup? I got the cup and later on I threw it against the wall and it got dented. And I, and I was really disappointed not winning the Pony Club Camp Cup, but for, for funny reasons, I still have this cup to this day. It lives in my office and I see it every, pretty much every single day. It says, Oliver Benyon, Wadden Chase Pony Club, long-term camper cup. It's slightly squint and it has a dent on the back from me throwing it against the wall. And the reason I've kept this cup all these years is I, I want to remind myself that the Christian faith isn't about being the most successful, uh, being the best at, uh, at what I do. Um, it, it is about being the person who gets the end of their life and can know with certainty that they can come in front of the Lord and he will say to them, you know, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and let's celebrate together, it says in Matthew 25. I want us all to receive long-term camper cups. Anyone can win the Pony Club Camp Cup once, you know, be great Christian for one year. But I want us all to get to the end of our lives saying, yes, I ran my race well. To be those who know that we never took our eyes off the prize of what awaits us in heaven. And it's so important to have that kind of goal in sight. Um, you know, over the last you know, few years, Lois and I have gone through some really challenging uh, moments in, in our lives. And it's been particularly difficult at, at times. And there have been many points when it, it would have been so much easier to take a different path, an easier path, the one that would have been um, less personally costly, that would have been less sacrificial. But um, I knew that wasn't, we knew that wasn't the right path to take. That wasn't the godly path to take. What has helped us every day is to keep our focus on remain, uh, remaining, you know, daily on the goodness of God. Uh, you know, the goodness of what he's done in the past, what he's doing now and what he will do in the future. And also having people around us who, who we love, who are journeying this with us and who are speaking this goodness of God into our lives. You know, Paul, he got to the end of his life and he is about to receive his long-term camper cup. You know, receiving that crown of righteousness that he talks about that was in store for him. That is what he's so excited about receiving. I am determined to win that prize as well. And so why not make that same decision yourself you know maybe this is the first time you're gonna make a decision wonderful that's the best news ever please do tell us but maybe it's the hundredth time you've done it it really it doesn't matter um this what it matters is saying yes to following jesus every day of your life um a few weeks ago lois and i were chatting with our some of our best friends about you know what it looked like to make our lives count and we were talking about what we would like to have written on our, in our gravestone. It's a bit of a strange thing to be speaking about, but that's what we were doing. And um, Lois came up, she, uh, my wife, she said, um, I would like two words to be written on my gravestone. I thought that would be pretty cheap, nice. Uh, and the words are, she obeyed. She obeyed. Now, she did mean it, make it very clear that it wasn't about that you know, she obeyed me but she meant that she obeyed Jesus, that she wanted that she went through her whole life saying yes to Jesus. And that would mean that she had been building his kingdom throughout her life and that there's nothing more worthy to live your life for than that. 
So let it be our ambition, our goal in life, to be able to say at the end of our life, that I have fought the good fight. I have run, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And so ask yourself, how can I live that today? In order to enable me to say those words then. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony and the incredible legacy of those who have gone before us, who have endured to the end. And we are beneficiaries of that. We have heard this good news message because of those who've gone before and have kept going. Lord, fill us right now, wherever we are, with your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit to help us to keep going, no matter what our circumstances. I know some of us will be going through some really difficult times at the moment. Lord, help us through this time and help us to live the life that you are calling us to live, to be obedient, to say yes to following you, to be kingdom people. And help us to be people who, no matter uh, what happens in life, that we say we, we, are, we, we say yes to following you, that we are spirit-filled. We thank you, Lord, that you are moving in our lives. We thank you for what you have done, and we, we look forward to what is in store for us in the future. In your mighty name, amen.